So, good afternoon. Um, my name is Simon Jeff. I work at the European Bioinformatics Institute just in uh, Cambridge up the road. Um, we are primarily a public archive of biological molecular data, public data, and um, we have a range of services really for adding value um, to those data. Um, I work in the Samples, Phenotypes and Ontologies team, and I'm just going to give you a brief overview of a project that we've been running for the last year, which is to build a new um, ontology lookup service, and we've done this um, using Neo4j. So we heard a bit this morning um, this idea that biological data is heavily interconnected. Um, and one of the challenges is um, how we deal with the kind of integration of this data, right? So how do we um, know that a particular protein in one database is the same as a protein in another database? And one of the ways that we try and tackle this is to try and understand um, the types of data that we have so that we know that, you know, what type like a gene is or a protein or a pathway. Uh, and we do this through developing standards and um, particularly controlled vocabularies or ontologies. And the reason we need terminology standards um, is fairly obvious, but you can imagine a disease like dyschromatopsia, which uh, we would probably know as color blindness. And there's a whole range of terms and words that we can, um, that are related to this concept, this wider concept of the disease. Um, and one of the challenges is how we understand the relationship and the connections between these terms. And we can illustrate the problem quite easily, just looking at a sort of basic search engine. So here's a search engine over the literature. Uh, search for color blindness, we get 647 results. Um, if I search for dyschromatosia, I get 270 results. And if I want to do something more general, like search for, okay, data or papers on abnormalities of the eye, uh, I actually get no results and have to do some kind of expanded search. Um, so we're looking for ways to try and normalize the vocabulary that we use to improve how we can do search and integration over the data. So that's the wider problem. Um, so for something like colorblindness, what we would do is to build an ontology. And this basically involves two steps. One is accessioning the terminology of the domain. Um, so we've got this chromatosia here. We can assign an ID to this concept. And then we can start to talk about the relationships between the other terms from the domain. So we can say that, okay, this chromatopsia is a type of abnormality of color vision. And there's some specializations like dichromacy. And there's also a relationship to other terms. So we know that this is a disease that is located uh, in the eye, which is from some anatomy ontology. So this is how we sort of build up ontologies around our terminology. And in addition to the kind of concepts and relationships, we also want to capture kind of additional metadata about these terms. So we might have things like synonyms, color blindness, uh, textual definitions, and, and so on. So um, that's a kind of brief overview of how we build these terminologies and, and build ontologies. And um, we've been very busy in the life sciences over the last 10 years. So this kind of gives you a, an idea of the number of ontologies that we have now that basically cover the full sort of domain of biology, going right down from genotypes up to phenotypes. So we've got anatomy ontologies, ones for specific types of species, um, disease ontologies, plant ontologies, and so on. So there's a whole load of ontologies out there. And then the next challenge is, okay, well, how do we actually work with these in the sort of informatics um, environment? How do we programmatically access all these ontologies? And um, one of the services that we've had at the EBI for over 10 years has been an ontology lookup service. And we've just basically rewritten this um, over the last year. So it's currently in beta. We're, we're releasing the new site this week. Um, and it's a repository. We, it basically contains the 140 biomedical ontologies that we pull in from all the external sources where these are published. So this represents about 4.5 million biological concepts. Um, we have 11 million relationships in there between those concepts. And in terms of the underlying database, uh, we use a solar index for dealing with all the textual index for the text search. And then we've used a Neo4j graph database for handling all the connectivity of the terms. Uh, we use the Spring Data platform to build the REST API, because this is actually, I mean, although we provide this nice search interface, uh, the majority of our usage comes through the, the REST API. So the, our users are really interested in just programmatic access to these ontologies. So we provide a good REST API to the ontologies. Um, and I should note that it's a fully open source project. Um, you can take any of the components of the code. So if you're just interested in building a Neo4j repository of ontologies, um, it will load in any flavor of OWL ontology. So it's not 
there's nothing particularly tied to the life sciences um, in terms of the infrastructure that we developed here. Only the user interface, I would say. So um, some of you may be familiar with the web ontology language, or OWL. So this is the W3C uh, standard for representing ontologies. So we, we don't actually have to deal with the fact that these ontologies are represented in multiple formats. We have a good representation for these ontologies. And OWL is an extremely powerful knowledge representation language. Um, but in terms of how we actually use and interact the ontologies, for the majority of our use cases, um, OWL ontologies per se, and if you know anything about the OWL representation, then they're not purely graphs. But they look like graphs. Um, they can be serialized as a graph, and you can use the RDF serialization for an OWL ontology to represent an OWL ontology in a graph structure. People want to use them as graphs, so this is the most key thing, really, is that you're typically talking about terms and how the terms are related. Um, and we initially looked at the sort of whole range of RDF databases around and thought, well, this would be the natural back end for an ontology repository. Um, but what we find is actually with all the um, RDF databases that are available, they're already incomplete with respect to OWL semantics. So you can't take the full advantage of OWL in any of these triple stores anyway. Um, and the Sparkle language, well, let's just say it's a bit of an acquired taste if you have any experience with it. And really the main barrier with Sparkle and trying to build a kind of application like OLS with it is the kind of support in terms of frameworks. So, you know, you've got nice fr web frameworks like Spring for developing applications and really, you know, semantic web technologies and Sparkle are not well catered for in that domain. Um, so we had a pilot to look at Neo4j, can we make a simplified representation of these ontologies that meets the majority of our use cases? Um, and this proved to work quite nicely, actually, for what we wanted to do. Um, I won't go into too much detail um, on how we do the translation from OWL to Neo4j, um, but it is basically a lossy conversion. So we, we take the OWL representation. Um, in OWL, we have notions of classes, properties, so relations of first class citizens in OWL, and instances of classes. So these are the three main types that we index in our Neo4j um, schema. Um, we label all the nodes accordingly, whether they're a class property or individual. And we also label the nodes based on the ontology that they come from. So we have an index per ontology. Um, we take all the OWL annotation properties, so labels, descriptions, comments, any of the metadata about a particular term we just store as uh, node properties in Neo4j. And then this is where we kind of fudge the representation slightly because uh, we take only a subset of these um, relationships from OWL. Uh, like I say, OWL relationships between classes aren't technically direct relationships between classes. So we have to, in OWL, you might have a representation of a heart, which would be represented as a heart being this subclass of part of some cardiovascular system, um, which is a kind of logical representation. And we would just collapse this down in our neo for j representation to a much simpler heart is part of cardiovascular system, so a simple triple. Um, there's more documentation online about how much of the OWL um, uh, vocabulary we actually support in this conversion. So having done this, what are the kind of things that we can do with it? So we can start to now load all these ontologies into this representation, and we can do some quite nice simple queries over all this biological knowledge. So um, simple cipher query here. Um, what are the subtypes of color blindness? Well, we know that um, human phenotype ontology gives us an ID for color blindness now. And we can simply pull in all the transitive subtypes and pull out this sort of subgraph of color blindness. Um, we can look at more complicated examples. So what are the parts of the eye that are related to disease? Again, we can use parts of the Uber anatomy ontology, um, looking across for anything that are part of the eye, which has this Uber on ID, uh, and then any disease um, any diseases that are located in the eye. So you can start to see how we can build up these queries that explore the structure of our knowledge that's captured in these ontologies. Uh, another thing that we, that's quite useful, um, <coughs> we're often interested in looking at common ancestors and kind of shortest path type queries. This is something that's nicely supported in Neo4j. This is something that we didn't get out of the box with um, some of the RDF databases that we were initially looking at. Um, so we can look for things like common taxonomic superfamilies um, with a very simple cipher query. Um, what we're really using the uh, cipher for is to generate visualizations in OLS. So 
Uh, if you go to the OLS site and you start searching for terms, we can pull out things like partonomy very quickly. So we can say, okay, what's the partonomy for heart? Um, with a very simple query and then generate a nice visualization. We've also de developed the graph based visualization where you can sort of click and explore uh, rather than these ontology terms. And like I said, the important thing for our users is our REST API. Um, so using the power of Spring Data REST, we get this very nice um, hypermedia driven API around where you can navigate each of the individual ontologies, drill down to the terms into those ontologies. And actually it's a fully crawlable API, so you can crawl all the terms and we capture all the relationships from each terms as part of this kind of rest, standard REST structure. How we actually build the index. So we, like I say, we have around 140 external ontologies that we check every night. So any changes in those files, we rebuild. We have a master Neo4j index um, and basically we remove any ontology that's changing and then we reload. And we re reload using the batch inserter. Um, so this gives us really sort of fast loading times um, but if you know about the batch inserter, um, it's not transactional safe. So we have this kind of potentially fragile process where we can corrupt our index. But to be honest, we can build the whole index in less than sort of four hours um, for all those ontologies. So it, we, it's a, something that we can deal with nightly. But uh, if there's anyone from the F4J in the room who knows about this, then we might be able to look for some optimizations here. Um, and then once we've built the index offline, we then push it out to various data centers and we kind of load balance this over a few time types so we get quite a nice sort of scalable um, platform for our APIs. So to conclude, uh, we've built this uh, repository that we believe is very scalable, uh, provides a unified access to all the ontologies, most of the important ontologies that are out there in biomedicine. Um, the infrastructure is generic, so um, if you're working with ontologies represented in OWL, you can take this code, you can build a Neo4j index over any OWL ontology. We're also starting to support SCOS, so other W3C representations for things like Thesauri we can handle. Um, I think it's really nice, the integration of Neo4j with Spring, so I mean it's very few lines of code and we get this powerful REST API on top of the data. Um, we actually have this deployed both, well, starting to be deployed externally, so a lot of external projects, um, some pharma companies are now interested in just taking this because it kind of just solves that um, ontology problem for them of having to deal with all these different ontologies. Um, we've got quite a large user base already for the beta. We have around 2,000 users, active users at the moment, um, and a lot of it is just through this API. So what will happen is you'll get a release of a database and they'll usually hammer it for a load of annotation um, annotating new data with ontology terms. Um, things that I'm interested to discuss with any, if there's any experts here are ways to improve our batch inserter and the migration to Spring Data near for, near for J4 because we're currently running on Spring Data 3. And with that, I'll conclude. And uh, there's a bunch of guys back in our team in Cambridge who are working on the project. We also had um, help from the Flax company on the, the BioSolar project and the guys at GraphAware who have helped us get started with Neo4j and provided some really great training for us. And uh, that's it, thanks. <laughs> I spilled this water. Any questions? <clears throat> yeah. I've worked on matching and getting definitions clear and standardised across a health organisation, which I can't name. Uh, we had to deal with all those sort of different interpretations and meanings manually and have discussions to reconcile. Did you do the same thing or did you find some automated process for merging these different ontologies together? <coughs> to be fair, we don't deal with that. So we, we, we put the ontologies together in a single place where you can query them. The, the only kind of harmonization we've done is around things like, what's the predicate that they were using for the description? You know, like we, we normalize how they're describing certain features of a term, but we don't yet deal with, okay, we try and work out that these two terms are actually equivalent. Um, we're mostly doing that manually, so it's through sort of manual creation of just mapping and saying, okay, this term from this ontology cross-references to this term, and that, that's a kind of, next project yeah and we have curators that do that
manjeli. Ano? Ok, tam mi zanimalo. Ok, vrnač.